Thanks for coming and seeing this video. I'm Shannon Brownlee. I'm the Senior Vice President of the Lown Institute based in Brookline, Massachusetts, and I'm also a co-chair of the Right Care Alliance. We're a grassroots organization mobilizing for radical change in the healthcare system. And I'm here today with Lee Simmons. Uh, Lee Simmons is a primary care physician at the Mass General Hospital in Boston and um, is also assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. And Lee is in the thick of coronavirus. Um, uh, although it hasn't really started to peak in Massachusetts yet, uh, it's probably not quite as bad as it is in New York City. We're really interested in what's going on for you, for your hospital, for your patients. So welcome, Lee. Thank you for joining us on a Sunday morning. Oh, thank you, Shannon. We're really glad to have you. Um, so I wanted to just kind of um, get a sense of what you usually do at the hospital. What's a normal day at the hospital like pre-corona? Mm -hmm. Yeah, normal operations at Mass General in primary care are seeing our patients in the office for annual checkups and review of their preventive medicine needs, uh, follow-up visits for, say, diabetes and hypertension, and then urgent visits for things like sore throats and rashes and cough. Mm -hmm. That would be a pretty normal day in primary care. Um, things have changed a lot, as you might imagine. Uh, I bet they have. So um, what's your hospital done to prepare for coronavirus patients? Yeah, so our hospital undertook uh, significant efforts to make the hospital, first of all, safe for people who work there and people who come to get care there and then to expand its capacity to take care of the expected surge of patients with severe coronavirus disease. Um, starting last month, we began moving visits that could safely be done so to virtual visits by telephone or by video technology, and then canceling procedures that could be postponed uh, because of the need to conserve protective equipment um, like gowns and masks, and also to convert beds into ICU care beds for people with severe coronavirus disease. Uh -huh. and, um, and did those, were you involved in those preparations? Tell us a little bit about sort of what it was actually like day to day. Yeah, so for those of us in primary care, we were more involved in the um, deciding who could be moved to a virtual visit, how are we gonna manage our patients safely um, without seeing them in the office. We made some of those early decisions with our patients about uh, changing their care plans and keeping them away from the hospital when they didn't need to be and away from traveling in and, um, and keeping them as safe as possible. So those were the areas where I was involved early on, was mostly with my own patient panel. We also made some important decisions about our medical trainees. I oversee our medical student education and internal medicine at our hospital. And we had to make some difficult, but very important and uh, um, quick decisions about how involved they were going to be in the care of patients who might have coronavirus. And ultimately they were moved to non-clinical duties um, for the rest of March and all of April. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I bet those were hard decisions, and I bet some of them were really disappointed that they weren't going to be able to be right there. Um, yes and no. I think um, our students understood the rationale. One of our concerns was not only keeping them safe, but keeping our patients and employees safe from them, funny enough, um, because they, they knew that at their younger age and their greater mobility around the city, they might be at... Um, higher risk of bringing disease in uh, was one of the considerations. And uh, many of them needed to be home with family who were uh, suffering effects from this disease already. So uh, we've been pleased to see how many of them took up roles involving calling patients on the telephone, being of support to patients for needs such as um, arranging transportation and grocery shopping. It's really been an amazing effort, not just at our medical school, but across the country, what medical students have done when furloughed from clinical work. Yeah, yeah. Did, did that, you know, during that sort of prep time, did you, um, what, was, what did it feel like? I mean, was it scary or was it just like, okay, we got to do something different. Here we go. Um, I've heard people say when trying to, I think, make ourselves feel better, we were trained for this. And I would say we were not trained for this. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are some elements of this that I feel like I was perfectly trained for. Um, much of it, not at all. I mean, making these kind of decisions uh, about where you uh, 
uh, going to see your patients? How are you going to see your patients? How are you going to keep them safe and protected during this pandemic time? Were brand new things for all of us. So I would say that anyone who says it wasn't anxiety provoking uh, yeah. probably isn't being forthright. <laughs> very uh, unusual times, great leadership at our hospital that made us feel informed, a very transparent process, so we knew what to expect. Um, you know, in the early days of this, Anthony Fauci was saying over and over, if, if this works, everyone will say we overreacted, and I can definitely say we hope that we have overreacted. Unfortunately, it looks like we didn't, um, but uh, that feeling of maybe we're overpreparing was something we were all on board with doing. Interesting. So yeah. what's going on now? What's it feel like now? What's the flow of mm -hmm. patients like? And what are your specific duties at the hospital? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now we have, in primary care, we have converted almost all of our patient interactions to telephone and video visit. Mm -hmm. um, I have a panel of about uh, 1,100 patients. I don't expect to see any of them in person for several months. Wow. Which is really a different role um, for many of us. Um, Many of us have uh, started working in our respiratory illness clinics, which are special clinics separate from the usual primary care clinic in order to keep everybody safe with, uh, with different pathways to get in and out. In fact, uh, at our hospital, our sports medicine building was converted into a respiratory illness clinic because it's physically separate from the hospital, had easy pathways in and out for patients who have potential coronavirus infection. Um, many of us are working in that uh, arena. So we're seeing patients in person there and doing video and telephone visits with our regular primary care patients, doing as much as we can remotely, uh, which turns out to be quite a lot, and uh, more than anything, providing encouragement and support for the uh, long weeks ahead of being um, in quarantine at home, which many yes. of them are doing. So my son had a very high fever last week and we were worried and we did a video visit with an emergency physician uh, yeah, good. Yeah. with a hospital here in Washington, D.C. And it was incredibly effective. You know, he, we were able to supply him with a lot of the clinical information he needed and, um, and my son could sit there and answer questions groggily because he was, mm -hmm. he was really pretty, pretty out of it. But it was incredibly helpful and incredibly comforting to be able to yeah. see a physician and know yeah. that he could see my son. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it is weird to do it now by video, isn't it? Um, very different. So, um, it's, so what's, what's the atmosphere like in the hospital now? You know, you, you were going through this real prep time and, and now what kind of flow of patients are you seeing? What's, what's really happening? So the um, hospital has a designated uh, these respiratory illness centers. And some are pretty straightforward interactions that don't really need a doctor involved. For example, an employee at the hospital who has some minor symptoms but needs to be tested for coronavirus in order to know when she can return to work. That's mm -hmm. one group. The other group are people who have either severe lung disease or heart disease or on immune suppression who have symptoms that could be consistent with coronavirus. And they not only need to be tested potentially, but they also need a clinical assessment by a doctor. So they're being seen by uh, physicians who have expertise in this area, primary care physicians, um, subspecialty physicians in internal medicine working in the respiratory illness clinic. So that's a pretty busy clip. So the medical directors of that clinic have uh, really done a fantastic job of training dozens of physicians to work in that clinic, going through a very strict protocol of seeing patients in those clinics and uh, making sure it's safe for both the employees and also the patients coming through. Um, it's not, uh, it's not a walk-in clinic. It's all by appointment. As much as possible is done by telephone, even having people stay in their cars until their appointment time has come up. Mm -hmm. um, when they're in the waiting room, which doesn't accommodate many people because there are only a few chairs in a large waiting room, people are separated really uh, carefully. And then they're guided by a guide who takes them through the clinic so that there's no wandering or exposure for the patient. Um, so really different medicine. I'll give an example that, um, that was a different way for me to practice, which was when you invite a patient into the exam room with you, my first words to them are, this table is clean, put all of your things on the table, don't touch anything, sit down on the table. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how welcoming that sounds. <laughs> I know, but it's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, if it's said in the right tone, you can, yeah. you can do it, but you must do it. And, and then my next sentence is, 
if you think you're going to cough, turn your head to the wall. Yeah. Um, and then the examination is very minimal because we are trying to limit how close we are physically to people, which is um, a different way of practicing medicine, I'll tell you. But um, patients have been remarkably accepting of that and understanding. And uh, it's the way we're going to have to practice if we all want to survive it. Yeah. So, and what are you wearing? What, what kind of gear are you wearing in those kinds yeah. of encounters? Yeah. So they're providing standard personal protective equipment, which is uh, a gown, a yellow. Right. Uh, Papery paper gown. Yeah. Gown. Um, goggles, a surgical mask, mm -hmm. and gloves. Mm -hmm. And then you, you keep the mask and the goggles on throughout your session, but you're changing the gown and gloves um, between each patient interaction. So you don't quite look like a Star Wars stormtrooper yet. Not for this kind of interaction yeah. with what we're doing in a um, urgent care type setting. Right. That would be different if you're involved in, say, um, intubation procedures or ICU care or surgical procedures, but that's not what we're doing. So where do you think um, Mass General is and, and Boston is really in the curve, the, the corona curve? Is it the calm before the storm or are you already seeing part of the storm? Um, you know, uh, our hospitals are reporting larger and larger numbers of patients who are needing ICU care. That's on the, on the news. So I think it's certainly here, um, whether it's the calm before the storm, which is something we've been murmuring to each other for a few weeks. Um, it, people wonder when the bad week is coming. My hope, of course, as everybody's is, is that that bad week doesn't come, but um, I'll leave it to modeling experts and uh, hospital uh, executives to know when that might be coming. But um, certainly, certainly we're all bracing for that. And one of the very cool things I think that our hospital did and our medical directors of these respiratory clinics did was they trained up lots of doctors to work in this clinic and understand the routine so that when and if that comes, there will be hundreds of people ready to step right in. Step right into different kinds of roles in the hospital, like physician roles and nursing and that's right. That's right. So some of it, this is where the over-preparation might seem like it's a bit of an issue. Sometimes we've wondered, gosh, a lot of people are working in this clinic and learning these protocols. Are we all necessary today? Probably not today. In a week, though, it will be very important that you've already had hundreds of doctors go through the training and worked a few shifts in these clinics to be ready for what's coming. Yeah. If yeah. And I'm sure you've heard um, either stories through the news, maybe through the, or the Right Care Alliance, um, and maybe personal, personal contacts of physicians and, and other healthcare professionals in New York. And it's kind of a different story for them. Um, oh. And does that, I mean, does it seem completely impossible and unreal, or does it seem like this is what we're getting ready for? Um, you know, I think the situation in New York is so horrific. I cannot even imagine what it feels like to be someone living there, much less somebody working in one of those hospitals. We're all hoping we are nowhere near something like that. Yeah, yeah. Hoping the social it distancing. Impossible. It does not seem impossible. Um, um, yeah, yeah. But we certainly hope it's not. So um, what are the, the big challenges for you personally and professionally right now? Um, you know, do, is, is what, what worries you most right now? Um, I worry about my colleagues who are in emergency medicine and who are in ICUs having a lot of exposure to patients with high viral loads where we feel based on studies um, of the healthcare workers being sick in um, Italy and in China, uh, and I think also in the Philippines, um, where there's just very high exposure to high viral loads where they're getting very, very sick. So I worry about that a lot. Um, I also worry very much about the um, economic effects of the job losses and the social distancing. And then I worry about my patients in primary care who um, are finding that either they're hesitant to call with symptoms that they should definitely be calling about, you know, new chest pain or weakness in an arm or abdominal pain that could be something quite serious but isn't coronavirus related at all. And they're fearful either one, that their doctor's office can't accommodate them right now, or two, they don't want to come in because they're afraid of getting coronavirus. That's, that's scary to people. And so that's something I'm thinking about a lot. Yeah. Um, we're also starting to worry now about the effects of just this prolonged uh, near sheltering in place on people in tough home life situations like domestic violence and when and if we'll see um, 
some of the effects of that. These are the things that are on our minds. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, and is there, is there, do you think that there's anything that, um, that should be done to slow or stop the spread that isn't being done, either at the state level, at the federal level? I mean, it sounds like your hospital is doing everything that it can to really be ready for whatever comes your way. But there's all this other stuff that is supposed to happen on the outside mm -hmm. that yeah. may or may not be happening. Is there anything that you think should be happening uh, that isn't? Yeah. I mean, certainly everybody would far rather be worried about preventing the infections in the first place than do we have enough ICU beds. Obviously, that's the answer. Um, our state has had a good response with um, pretty broad reaching measures to get people to stay in the home. I think that um, there may be a need for even greater enforcement of that. I think that our biggest concern is where there are hot spots, and we've seen some of these in nursing homes and senior living communities. Do we have enough tests to do contact tracing and reach out to people? It seems like, as you've heard on the news over and over, one of the greatest failures here is having enough tests to do um, early and extensive investigation. Um, I often think, gosh, why did it why did it kind of hit me in late February early March what a crisis this was going to be when maybe we all should have known and I think it was that I I didn't think we'd ever be in this situation without testing yeah 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 and yeah. and when you don't have the tests and when we are having to make difficult decisions uh, when seeing patients with illness about whether we can test them or not because we just don't have enough tests that's uh, that's still one of our biggest hindrances and Anyone who says that that's not still a major problem is, is incorrect. It's, it's a major concern, especially from the public health standpoint. That's really, really a problem. And, and we've yeah. certainly heard that from other people as well, that the, that the lack of tests and the sort of triaging of tests, who gets the test and who doesn't, is, is crazy. Yeah. Crazy making. Yeah. But it's, yeah. Uh, that's a tough one. So what about your, your, your usual patients? I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of elderly patients, uh, a lot of patients with multiple chronic illnesses who... Mm -hmm. um, who need care? How how are they doing, and and how are you doing with with this limited ability to, to care for them? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, in some ways it's more limited. In some ways, it's it's expanded. So huh. um, it, the fact that now it's expected that we'll do things virtually. Um, which we, we do a lot of telephone management of things anyway with our patients in primary care, especially those who have mobility problems or for other reasons don't come into the office very much. Um, but it's nice that it's now an expectation that this is how we'll take care of them. Mm -hmm. um, some of the concerns I'm seeing are um, logistical, like how can you get your medicines from the pharmacy safely? Uh -huh. Why can't you get three months supply of a medication now? Why do you have to go back every month? Yeah. Especially now that we're hitting the worst time for viral community spread. I mean, this really worries me that some of my patients will try to brave their way to the pharmacy. Um, and, and that's something that I'd love to see lifted and barriers um, come down for easy access to your medications that you need. Um, getting enough nutritious food in the house uh, without personal risk of, of heading to the grocery store is something else that we're worried about. So those are some basics. Um, I think that uh, the social isolation is extreme here. Yes. And unless there are great ways to um, address that with frequent phone contact for some of our patients, this could be deadly. Mm -hmm. And um, we have some of, some of my own patients we've identified with one of my nurses um, who need frequent phone outreach and encouragement to keep doing what they're doing. And, uh, save people's lives by staying in their home and they're doing it, but it requires a ton of support. Um, so those are some of my concerns. My other, as I mentioned before though, is that people have concerning symptoms that uh, may be coronavirus related, may not be, but they're failing to get them addressed. We have no reason to think biologically why there would be fewer strokes and heart attacks right now. We huh. do know there might be fewer car accidents and um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, athletics related injuries, that makes sense to me. But the other stuff, I'm not sure it makes any sense. So that means that some things are happening and people are not calling about them. And maybe that's okay in some circumstances. It's an interesting phenomenon where we're seeing that some things there can be a safe and appropriate delay in evaluation. But I'm not sure I feel comfortable saying that just yet. And I do worry about what's happening and people are not telling me. Yeah, I bet. I bet. 
Well, so is there anything that you would like to say or that we haven't dis that, uh, you know, you think we haven't discussed about this issue about COVID? Yeah, um, well, I think that what I'm trying to be very careful about is taking note of things that we're actually doing better in medicine as a result of this crisis, mm -hmm. because at the end of this, we might as well learn some good lessons that will allow for more effective and efficient delivery of primary care services and to be freed from some of the constraints of billing guidelines and documentation guidelines that are such uh, a concern for us in primary care it has, has been quite nice. And, uh, and, and I'm not going to forget that. Um, I'm not going to forget what it felt like to be able to deliver the care that you want to, with the exception of not being able to see somebody in person. But otherwise, you've been, we've been able to do it quite effectively, and it's been acceptable to patients as well. Um, I'm just trying to take careful notes about the things that we need to keep after this all has passed. And, and we don't know when it'll pass. I think in primary care, we'll be worrying about coronavirus for many, 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 many months. It's not going away, um, especially if we as they say, flatten the curve appropriately, we'll, we will be dealing with this for months. So it's going to color all of our interactions for quite a while. So figuring out services that work safely and effectively in primary care from here on out is going to be one of our greatest lessons. Well, you know, that leads me to, to one of my last questions, which is um, you're a member of the RCA. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and the RCA is working right now on creating a blueprint of what a new health system really could and should look like. Yep. And how do you see the RCA playing a role, um, maybe now in the crisis, certainly if there's any things that, that um, grassroots organizing can do to make things better right now, but especially in the aftermath of this, yep. what, role, what role do we have as activists? Yeah, um, I, I consider my RCA membership more, um, more important to me than ever uh, in this time. One of the areas I think that the RCA can be most effective at. Our, our strength is in all the different roles we all play in the healthcare system. We have people who, ha who are patients with severe disabling illnesses who have a lot of experience in bringing, um, bringing uh, both terrible stories, but then also ideas for great improvement to the forefront. So we need to listen to them and pull those ideas of things that went well during this pandemic to the top. Um, and then of course we have uh, clinical professionals in several different roles who again can share their experiences about what, what, what went horribly during this time, which is gonna be a lot of it because of the disease, and then what went very, very well. Uh -huh. um, so, so that's what I hope we don't forget. We've got people who are actively seeing patients where um, we're not, uh, just locked up in offices, we're, we're right in the thick of it and we'll have a lot to share. So I think we, we document, document, document and pull it all together. Um, this is going to, to I think, um, color very strongly our, our manifesto for, for change and, uh, and let's not waste this opportunity. That's great. Thank you very much for that. So, um, Lee, it's really been a pleasure to, to have a yeah. chance to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking time out of one of your few days off. Um, if it's a really a day off or you're just going in late, I don't know. And I don't know that. I might get called. We'll find out. <laughs> so. but, but most importantly, thank you for your service. You yep. are um, among a, a battalions, armies of, of healthcare workers who are doing amazing work and important work. And I hope that um, it is rewarding work, at least in some ways. It sounds like it is for you. And um, we thank you for what you're doing. Um, also on the line, we have Dr. Vikas Sani. Uh, Vikas is my dear colleague. He's the president of the Lown Institute and co-chair with me of the Right Care Alliance, the RCA. He is a clinical cardiologist and we're delighted to have you with us, Vikas. Thanks for being here. I'm glad we can have a chance to talk about this afterwards. Um, one of the things that really struck me was that um, that, that the, Lee was talking about things that were working, um, things that were different in the way she was able to take care of her patients, um, interactions she was having that was different, that was better than pre-COVID. 
And, and that strikes me as kind of a surprise. And, and we should be taking this very seriously and thinking about it very seriously when we think about how do we make our healthcare system better? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no doubt about it. I mean, look, I think uh, at the end of the day, she had a, a, a relatively uh, positive take that, you know, I think some of that may well just be her her style and her personality, but there's no question that situation at her hospital <clears throat> seems to be under reasonable control. There's been, uh, I think, decent amount of planning given how, you know, screwed up this has been nationally for so long. So in that sense, I, th I think she's lucky. I think, you know, in Massachusetts here, we're probably lucky. I, I, I got to say that Baker, having been a healthcare executive <clears throat> in his prior life, I think he has his fingers on, on a lot more. Uh, so on all those grounds, I think this is, it's important to remember, this is a partial view and it's, it's probably a good view. But this is an example of, you know, rules that get tossed aside when, when, when the pressure of the moment requires it. And that's sort of the, the uh, testing by fire, what is and isn't important. And I think that's a good way to think about what, you know, what Lee's saying, what we would keep in, in, in the new health system or the next health system, whatever, however you want to think about it, is that there's all these things that can change when you really, really have to make them change. And some of them may be temporary for emergency reasons, but some of them may be discoveries that you don't need to do this crap. And how could we keep doing it that way? So I think that it's an important dimension. And I think it's uh, something we all got to think hard about. Well, you know, to me, the other piece of it that, that sort of came through in the conversation with her is that, um, is that there's a lot of lip service paid to relationships and healthcare and high touch care and all this kind of stuff. But in the, in the end, it's not profitable. You don't make money on sending nurses out to people's houses in the same way that you make money on doing elective surgeries. And so the hospitals have effectively been forced to stop the elective surgeries to be able to absorb the, the surge of COVID patients. But you know, given business as usual, they're gonna do elective surgeries before they're gonna send visiting nurses out to take care of people with chronic illnesses. And, we have to really confront that piece of it, I think, if, if we're going to really make the kind of changes in the healthcare system that, that this, this epidemic is helping sort of expose that are needed. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, look, the, the whole issue of elective surgeries is, is obviously, uh, you know, a political football. I mean, uh, thinking about Canada, oh, they got to wait months and months for elective surgery. Well, I, I heard who was it? <laughs> a friend of mine who uh, who has a close relative or family friend who's a senior executive at a hospital somewhere in the south. I'll leave it there. Was saying, yeah, you know, we 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 kind of have had to cancel all these elective surgeries, but I don't know how many of them were needed anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, really. <laughs> so you know, you get into this question about uh, what is and isn't a reasonable or appropriate to do clinically is a sliding scale, depends on circumstances. You know, in the midst of a pandemic, a lot of stuff that was kind of nice to have suddenly isn't. And so maybe there's a need for some kind of recalibration of, around that sort of thing. Uh, you know, but, but that's kind of, I think, um, one dimension of this and, and, and only one. I, I also think that this whole question about, uh, you know, how we use technology you know, trial by fire is, 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 is not a bad thing in this setting. I mean, during the wars, you know, there are huge technological leaps and things that are, you know, useful and important persist, you know, one would like to think. And I think we're in one of these moments. I've always thought that a lot of what's been coming out of Silicon Valley in healthcare, you know, and I think cheap funding helps, you know, because you fund all sorts of things, some of them not great ideas. Um, but I think, you know, in this kind of trial by fire, you're in a place and a situation where you're actually going to have a Darwinian kind of culling of a lot of fluffy technology. And, and hopefully, it's, at least that's my hope, we'll sort of figure out the stuff that really matters. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that, you know, hopefully we'll get a mass market and, and really be able to scale rapidly. So there's a, a silver lining in this awful cloud and, and it 
definitely awful. I, I think what we're hearing from Lee is one side. If we hear from some of our colleagues in the Right Care Alliance in New York, it's going to be oh really yeah. Well, and what we're going to hear from patients who, you know, live in really constrained circumstances, like you know, they have family members who have diabetes, and you know, the the one family member works at Costco and and comes home every day to people who are at highly at risk of getting infected. Right. That's hard. It and is. we don't hear enough about that. I, I have a good friend who's working uh, at one of the grocery stores, one of the large national grocery store chains. And, um, you know, he has been emailing me for weeks talking about, you know, here's how we're doing this. Is this okay? And I, I constantly would have to say, you know, don't take your breaks in the break room. Get the hell out. And, you know, are you, are you sort of cleaning and spraying the checkout counters and all that kind of stuff? And they wouldn't let him wear masks or gloves because it didn't look right, you know. That might, ooh, infectious place. Yeah. Right. And and there are all these dimensions, but the thing that struck me most was without serious organized leadership from the top, I mean directive, clear, and and focused in, in, in a country this size and and with so much in, within the economy that that is. Uh, you know, free market, like, like in this instance, you know, every company was doing their own thing and different people had different rules and, and, and you cannot do good public health if you don't apply those rules broadly, you know? And, and I keep thinking now that, thinking about the other side of this, when things start easing up, which is a question I was having with my wife this morning, which is, I'm not, at some point we may end up with something like internal passports because you know let's say it's fading in massachusetts and, ho and hopefully in new york and it's just you know hot in, in other parts of the country what, what are we going to do are we going to just say you know come on down anybody come can we put up borders that's crazy we're not going to do that i don't know what we're going to do but we have to start thinking about those we have to too. think we have to start thinking about that stuff yeah. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation because thanks so much for, for finding time on a Sunday. And, well, uh, you know, we're home. 